Hi, I'm Richard Sever of Cold Spring Harbor Lab. With me I have Gerard Evan, Professor of Biochemistry at Cambridge. Hello. Gerard, hi. hi. Now we're here at the um, Cancer Symposium mm -hmm. and um, you, you'll be speaking later in the week on cancer signatures. Yep. Um, before we get to that, can you just give us the big picture about cancer evolution? I mean, you know, there's a, it's a heterogeneous mix of different cells yep. evolving. And mm -hmm. in the past, you've likened this to the Apollo 13 <laughs> mission. Can you, can you explain what you mean by that in terms of evolution of the cancer? Yes, so the language we use about cancer is loaded with um, terms that seem to imply that it's got a plan, it's got a purpose, and it's heading in a direction which is basically to kill the patient. So we use the word progression as the disease gets worse. But we really understand that cancers arise by uh, random mutations and then natural selection for the fastest growing or most surviving variant. And so it's a very random process. And the, the analogy that I always like to use is this one in Apollo 13, there's this wonderful moment where they, they've got too much carbon dioxide and they don't know what to do about it because they don't have scrubbers that remove the carbon dioxide and then um, they, they go off and ask people, to tell people they've got to sort this out and find a solution and a guy comes in with a big bag, um, a garbage bag and, and empties it on the floor and you see this just pile of debris and he says this is what they've got and we've got to make something that does that out of this. And it's that process of uh, cobbling together bits and pieces that may not work particularly well, but they work well enough, that is the hallmark of evolution. So when we look at cancers, we see this sort of chaotic process. Yet the remarkable thing about it is that cancers of particular tissues tend to look the same as each other. Uh -huh. So that means that though they arise by a random process of evolution and mutation and selection, something is constraining the way that they arise. So that, for example, the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer is it looks like a pancreatic cancer. It's got a lot of connective tissue and stroma. Uh, lung cancers look like lung cancers because they've got a lot of blood vessels. They, they look um, very different to each other, even when they seem to be caused by the same general types of mutations in the same general types of genes. So you're not seeing, um, it's not a kind of like a, 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 a sort of superficial similarity with um, different mutations. It's really a well, kind of canalized. Yeah, well that's, I guess, what we don't know. Mm -hmm. But the answer would be, why is it that through random mutations, pancreatic cancers all end up looking like that, and lung cancers all end up looking like that, and liver cancers end up looking like that? It can't just be random. There has to be something that's constraining it. So there are two possible explanations, both of which I think um, carry with them uh, some uh, explanatory merit. One is that the way that cancers can evolve in particular tissues is constrained by the way that that tissue works. That is, cancers look like they're hijacked, hacked versions of normal processes that occur in tissues, obviously not normally, when the but when the tissue is mm. damaged. And so essentially, um, when that tissue is damaged, the program that repairs that tissue is fairly specific for that tissue. And that just reflects about the different tissues are built in different ways. So and to, when your, you, to yeah. your Apollo 13 analogy, this is because the parts available in that rubbish bag that's are right. different in different organs. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. The, the other idea, which I think is also to some extent true, is that um, certain things, so, so there's initial constraint as to which mutations and which processes can get mutated in what way to drive a cancer. And then the other is there's probably some sort of top selection, which is certain types of mutation which give rise to faster growth in some tissues don't do so in another tissue uh -huh. um, because of you know, they, they, they just don't have the blood supply in that tissue. There's no way of making it that you could make in that tissue. So there's a constraint from the bottom up, which is canalization, and there's probably a limit from the top down in terms of what gives a selective advantage in that tissue versus that tissue. It's almost like internal as opposed to external Correct. constraints. Correct. Yeah. Right. And we're left trying to sort this out. Uh -huh. And of course, what we want to understand is, are there commonalities? And, and here it's important because we need to understand are there general principles in cancers, maybe mm. tissue by tissue. Because at the moment we know from all the omics expansion, the tremendous power of the technologies, 
that you can go into everybody's cancer and everybody's cancer is different from everybody else's cancer they're, because they arise by these spontaneous random mutations and even within cancers there's a huge amount of heterogeneity within the cells mm. cells going off and making different lineages and it's a, a real mess now the problem is if it's really irreducible as a complicated mess then it's it's just not going to be any way of really generally describing the process or of identifying general therapies. On the other hand, if it is, as it seems to be, quite highly constrained, then we can imagine that there will be general principles that would apply to most cancers, maybe all cancers that arise in that tissue or in that tissue, and there even may be general principles that apply to all cancers in all tissues. So, so in that scenario, and I think you've said this mm. before, it's, it's, it's almost like the opposite of precision medicine or the opposite of yes. personalized medicine. Yes, I, I like the idea of impersonalized medicine. medicine. Yeah. I think it's very easy to get bogged down in the differences between cancers, but just because there are differences doesn't mean to say they're different. Right. So all humans have huge differences one from the other, but they share a huge amount of commonality. Right, antibiotics and, yes, work yeah, if you've got plague. Absolutely right. right, yes, and it doesn't matter who you are, unless, of course, you're allergic to the antibiotics. Right. But that's exactly right, that's the, the perfect analogy. So if we could identify what are the nodes, the shared common elements that go wrong uh, in cancers, then there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to develop therapies that work against many cancers, maybe all. I know it sounds like science fiction, uh -huh. but to me it's an absolute real possibility. Right. And, and, and the work, how does the work you've been doing, so you recently I understand you've been looking at MYC and mm -hmm. RAS in, yeah. in pancreas and right. lung. Yeah. What, what have you been doing there to try and um, look at this issue of constraints? Okay, so the idea is very simple. You take the two archetypical oncogenes, RAS and MYC. We know they cooperate, so that means that RAS does something that MYC doesn't do, MYC does something that RAS doesn't do, and you need to put them together to get the full process of tumorigenesis or at least to provide the flat platform upon which further evolution of tumors mm -hmm. um, can, can, can arise. And the reason that RAS and MYC, I think, are important is you want to hit the platform. You know, if you build a platform upon which these tumors all depend, and upon that you erect minor variations that give this clone a bit more of an advantage to this and a bit less of an advantage to that, targeting these, these secondary phenomena is not going to knock out the platform. Yeah. So we want to hit... You're just cutting off one yeah, head. Absolutely, and not yeah, the the body. You're, you're going head by head to hit the hydra. There's actually, what you want to do is pour bleach on the, on the thing and right. make it, you know, wipe <laughs> it out completely. You want to hit the node. So we've been basically um, building um, in vivo mouse models where we flick on Mick and Raz, this archetypical um, uh, uh, oncogenic cooperating pair, in different tissues, in adult tissues and asking what happens. And in all cases, it drives tumorigenesis very, very effectively, almost instantaneously, which has and also- And because you have to have both, do you? You have right, to have both. Right. If you have one without the other, it's a cul-de-sac. So RAS without mm -hmm. MYC, you arrest permanently. MYC without RAS, you die. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the classic way I think the biology solves the problem of how to make something incredibly easy when you want it to happen, but incredibly difficult when you don't want it to happen. It's the same way that we make it easy to get into our house for, for us, but difficult for someone else. There's a combination. Uh -huh. So you have to have the combination of Mick and Raz, and who knows, there may be other um, components to the combination lock. But once you activate those together, because you can't do it separately because they cul-de-sac separately, then you get the full-blown cancer. So what is that cancer? Well, the cancer looks like it's a hacked regenerative program from that tissue. Because Mick and Raz, if you activate it in pancreas, what you get is immediately a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. So no blood vessels, lots and lots of connective tissue, all the immune attributes of pancreatic cancer. You take the same Mick Raz pair in lung, switch them on, and you get a full-blown non-small cell lung cancer. Huge numbers of blood vessels, highly inflammatory, looking very, very different in structure and very, very different, presumably, in terms of what you would think would be the important things to target in each case. But the truth is, there's a principle of equivalence, if you like, underneath it, although they look very different. They're driven by the same so nodes. It's just a different manifestation. Absolutely of the, right. In the uh, same way as you could say, well, the cell cycle gives rise to essentially all tissues, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much the same cell cycle. 
But if you looked at all tissues, you'd think, oh, maybe they presumably have all different cell cycles. And that's actually not the case. And the, the other analogy that I find very useful is that, you know, uh, long before people got old enough to ever get cancer, when we were back in as, as primitive humans living on the plains in Africa, um, we were being invaded by highly genetically diverse, rapidly proliferating cells, and they were called bacteria. And if we discovered bacterial, if we discovered infectious disease in the era of omics, we would have been saying, oh, you have to have a different way of targeting each different bacterial infection. And it's not true. If you hit them where, where, where they share common dependencies, you can wipe them out. And that's why we have antibiotics. And we discovered antibiotics long before the omics revolution. Yeah. Well, it's that's fascinating stuff. And we um, certainly wish you luck with that one size fits all approach. <laughs> I hope it's true. <laughs> Who knows? That's what we're trying to find out. So thank you very much. Well, good luck with it. Jared. Okay. Take care.